Welcome to today's Global Connections program. I'm Bill Miller. What are some of the major challenges confronting the world today, such as climate change, refugees, and terrorism? How did the media, especially the United States media, cover these important issues? We'll be back in just a moment to talk about these and other issues. Welcome back to our program. Today we're taking a look at the media and how they cover really important issues such as climate change, terrorism, and many others. And of course, we, all people in the United States and people all around the world, heavily depend upon the media to provide us information. Our guest today is an expert on the issues and the media. My guest today is Laura Flanders. Laura Flanders is a best-selling author and broadcaster. After many years in public and commercial radio, Laura founded The Laura Flanders Show and Grit TV. She's a contributing writer to The Nation magazine and Yes magazine, as well as being a TV commentator and the author of six books. Laura Flanders, welcome to today's Global Connections oh, it's program. It's great to be with you to make this connection. I well, appreciate you here. finally put it together. <laughs> Thank you so much. Great to see you. Let's talk. We're going to get into some of these issues I mentioned a minute ago, but tell, tell me a little bit about the Laura Flanders show. What, uh, where can we find sure, it? Well, and it's not what is your in focus? A way. I mean, I you know, there's not a topic that you mentioned at the top of the program that doesn't get covered in the media in a way that I find fault with. Uh, and I think as a media critic for a very long time, I feel it's incumbent not just to criticize the way other people do it, but also to create your own, like you're doing it. I mean, say all of the issues that you raise, whether it's Syria or the climate change mm -hmm. uh, com convention uh, and conference, or I don't know, even the situation recently uh, with Iran and the Iran Accord, what we don't get is the picture of what role popular movements play in making change, what role people play in making change, which is often kind of dismissed as you know, a detail, but I think in every instance that you just mentioned, people power made a big difference. And we the people have um, a right to see our role represented. So I think the role of the Laura Flanders Show, I don't want to say simply, you know, we're interested in solutions journalism as opposed to problems journalism, but we do try to lift uh, democratic spirits and encourage people to get involved and, and, and profile the ways that getting involved can pay off. Mm -hmm. And our viewers can learn much more about it and go to by going to lauraflanders.com and pick up on your programs. Right. And you're on many, many outlets. Let's talk a little bit before we get into the issues. You are an author. I think you've written six books. What are just a couple of the, the well, books, I mean some the, of the titles? Well, I mean, one of the more recent ones, so the, the, there was a book called At the Tea Party, which was an edited volume about the Tea Party, in which I actually argued that rather than vilify a whole group of our neighbors, we should talk to people more often, talk to each other across a party and political difference more better maybe, more often and better. Uh, but I think the book that's most related to the work that I'm doing now is called Blue Grit, <laughs> how true Democrats uh, true Democrats take back politics from the politicians, which was the same idea of like seeing the way the social movements and grassroots groups were doing politics in many places better than the Democratic Party was doing it. Uh, and in a sense, that was kind of the root of the TV show that was Grit TV, that was a daily show on Free Speech TV and Link and, and other places, many of the same stations that carry your show. Um, and then became a weekly program, The Laura Flanders Show, about four years ago. Mm -hmm. Very good. Now, I'm sure you get into many international issues, international topics. Uh, have you had guests on recently who have talked about, say, climate change, maybe the COP21 conference in Paris, yeah, I mean, that's terrorism, a, things like yeah, that? I mean, that's a great case in point. We had on the other day, um, when I was in Los Angeles, and I was able to do a bunch of interviews with people there, uh, a great community organizer, Eric Mann, with the Labor Community Resource and Strategy Center. And here's a guy who works locally. He was part of pulling together what became the Bus Riders Union in Los Angeles. And yet he was taking a huge cohort, a, a whole contingent of his activists to Paris for the COP21 uh, conference. My question was why? What are these inner city activists in LA got to do with this international UN conference, which if you certainly, if you, if you 
relied on the mainstream c commercial media, I call it the money media, it's all about money. If you rely on that mm -hmm. media, you know, these high level talks have nothing to do with low level people. Um, well, he had a lot to say about the way that grassroots movements have changed the frame from a question of climate and danger and impact and mm -hmm. endangered mm -hmm. species to questions of justice, community, sustainability, power, corporate role versus democratic accountability. Uh, and it's those movements working together globally that have forced an agenda that, while we're not there yet, is seeing some progress, mm -hmm. at least, uh, this last December, but, but more generally, when it comes to our high place leaders, our high-level yeah. talks. Exactly. Very true. And as with many issues, many challenges, climate change is one that affects everyone, right. but so often the powerless, the people who have really have not contributed to climate change. For, for example, people living in economically developing countries who have a very low carbon footprint, a very small carbon footprint, right. but they still suffer the most. We see the Marshall Islands are about ready to go under at some point within right. the next 20 or 30 years. You see uh, the uh, Maldives, there are other areas adversely affected. But it is very important to have people to have input into this process because the people who are affected certainly should have a voice in trying to bring some change and to help move this conversation forward so that we can deal with this problem. Yeah, and I think, again, I mean, I think we get a lot of problem coverage and not very much solution coverage. And without being, <laughs> you know, glib about it, we had a guest on not so long ago, Anthony Lowenstein, who's an international reporter, been covering these questions and the questions of sort of disaster, what he calls disaster capitalism all around the world mm -hmm. for many years. And when I asked him for models of, well, what, what are people doing in terms of addressing some of this? Because particularly climate change seems so enormous and well mm -hmm. beyond what individuals, communities, low level folks can do. Not to be glib, I mean, we, we need international governmental change. But at the local level, there are amazing stories. Uh, mm -hmm. Germany, Scores of cities have voted to take back control over their public utilities, take it away from private corporations, put it back in the hands of their uh, local government. Same thing in Boulder, Colorado. Is there a relationship between these movements? Actually, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, are they up against pushback and backlash from the carbon corporations? Absolutely. But some models of what you can do mm -hmm. if your local <coughs> utility is not shifting its, res its, its reliance on carbon fuels to, s to renewables quickly enough, I think our media have a responsibility to mm -hmm. give people some idea of what their options might be uh, and to inform people about what's going on around them. Mm -hmm. Do you find, we, we see that the scientific studies overwhelmingly indicate that climate change is taking place. 97% of the scientists believe this. We see that the ice caps are melting, the seas are rising, desertification is taking place, coral reefs are bleaching. There's no question about it. Right. But when you look at some of the media outlets, now uh, some of the ultra-conservative media outlets, you expect this from them, but they put on the people who are flat earth <laughs> proponents right. or climate change deniers to a large degree. But do you think that the media does a disservice by not focusing more on the ill effects of climate change and getting people on, some of these scientists who know what they're talking about, instead of some politician or some scientist who's paid for by a fossil fuel company. Well, you have to think about our media. When you talk about mm -hmm. our media, you know, we have the news brought to, uh, brought to us by coal, gas, and, <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and oil. Look at the sponsors. Right, look at the sponsors, look at the advertisers. It's the mm -hmm. car companies. Uh, it's not the solar panel companies, at least not yet. You've had no, you know, now a decade at least of greenwashing by corporations mm -hmm. like British Petroleum that now present themselves as, you know, good, clean, better, green, whatever the heck their new branding is. Uh, and they are allowed to sort of yeah, rebrand themselves without any real commentary on what that's about. Mm -hmm. uh, I think you have to look at the financial interests of those, corpor of those corporate media and how dependent they are on those underwriters before you get too surprised about what comes out the other end of the sausage making machine. It's kind of mm -hmm. like the coverage of, of health care. You, know, you wonder why single payer health care in the United States gets such a bad rap and a mm -hmm. candidate like Bernie Sanders or someone who talks about it is presented as so crazy, even though he's the one who's in line with global opinion uh, and global practice in most of the developed world. Um, well, again, who's underwriting those television channels? Who's taking out the ads? It's the pharmaceutical companies, the insurance companies, the drug mm -hmm. manufacturers. Uh, it's not disconnected. And again, that means you have a systemic explanation for why it is like it is, not just that we have biased reporters and reporting mm -hmm. done poorly by, by, by uh, you know, 
inadequate journalists. No, we have a, an agenda being served, mm -hmm. uh, and it's it's not the agenda of change. That's true. Well, the landscape is changing quite dramatically. Coal is in deep trouble. No matter what <laughs> they say, coal is certainly on its well, way out know, the door. Coming from where you come <laughs> from, from a coal state, That's right? right. But uh, these folks really need to start looking at alternative forms of employment and alternative forms of energy. Yeah. But coal is in trouble. Oil will probably will be next, and gas will be after that. But that's years down the road, obviously. But solar is coming on very strong. You, you see that uh, windmills are coming on, wind uh, yeah. supplies. Do you think that the landscape is changing in this area, that uh, we're going to be forced to deal with this because they are now competitive with coal or with oil, yeah. and they can actually hold their own and they, the carbon footprint's almost not existent. I mean, it's interesting. You have some towns, I think Burlington, Vermont now, 100% mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's energy supply is coming from renewables. I was just in Europe a few weeks ago. You see mm -hmm. the wind turbines everywhere mm -hmm. uh, in a way that you don't hear. I mean, I think it's fascinating the perspective from a place like Kentucky, uh, your home state, where you can see that this, this discourse, this, the way that we are at loggerheads around this fight around coal isn't serving the people who are connected to the coal industry and have been mm -hmm. over generations, nor is it serving um, those who are trying to bring about change. We need places for a real conversation, and I think it's happening. I was in Appalachia a year and a half ago working for Yes Magazine and did a story about Appalachia after coal, and what I saw was a conversation that was beginning to have mutual respect, where the folks who were talking about the future were saying, but we get it, this is not that you, that you, the coal miner, uh, uh, you are not the problem. Your culture is not the problem. The problem is the structure of ownership and the lack of accountability of the corporations and their concentration of power here. Um, but we, sort of south, south, Main Street, Main Street, we need to figure out how to talk to each other better so that we don't replicate these patterns of power when it comes to new industries. So we don't want a solar, a solar system or a mm -hmm. wind system that's as hierarchical and power concentrated as we've had coal and gas and oil. Uh, we need something different. There are some co-op models out there that I think are interesting. And certainly mm -hmm. when it comes to local control over power, I think that question is as important as what kind of power it is. Mm -hmm. Well, climate change, given that it affects all 7.3 billion people on yeah. planet Earth, is probably, obviously, our number one challenge in the world, and it's getting worse. A lot of people disagree with that, but another problem, which is up there, is also terrorism. And, yeah. of course, we, we, when we think of terrorism, we think of ISIS, Daesh, whatever you want to call them, but there, there are many forms of terrorism. You have homegrown terrorists in the United States or in other countries. You have movements such as ISIS. How do you, how do you feel the media? And yeah. I know it's not fair to paint the, all the media with the same paint uh, brush, a broad brush, but how do you feel that they cover terrorism? And are we learning much about how to deal with terrorism? Well, you know, it's an interesting question, Bill, and I think that you're right that obviously climate change is a huge problem. Terrorism is another huge problem. I would say global inequality is the number one cause problem in my book. Uh, we, we have the latest statistics from Oxfam. What do they say? 62 people? People? have the same wealth as, the other, as half of the world population, you can't have a functioning society that way. And I don't think it's unrelated to these questions of violence. What we call terrorism d varies on, on who's doing it. But I don't think that question of inequality is divorced from the question of violence because people feel like there's no, they have no options, they have no access op to power. And I think that's not the only thing that fuels it. You have occupation, you have poverty, you name it. Um, you have political ideology, religious ideology. But it is interesting on the media question. I mean, mm -hmm. we've had in, in the beginning of 2016, this year, we've seen this extraordinary occupation of, of a wildlife preserve in Oregon by people the media consistently call activists. These are armed militias. If they were black, you think they wouldn't be called terrorists tomorrow? If they were Muslim, you don't think the media would be talking about this terrorist standoff? I mean, it's kind of extraordinary. The same challenge we've had in the United States getting all sorts of domestic terrorism uh, when it's done by white people against abortion <laughs> clinics or women's health centers, that kind of thing. Um, getting that called what it is. Uh, the shootings in Charleston um, by that young man who went into the church, the black church, and shot the congreg congregants, um, wasn't called a terrorist, mm -hmm. not by our media. It was called, you know, a disturbed person. 
uh, yeah, the language is very inflammatory. I, I think that one of the jobs that you do so brilliantly and that's so important is to emphasize there is another way of looking at all of this. And in fact, the United Nations has modeled a a, a, an approach mm -hmm. that's very helpful, an approach that prioritizes looking at root causes, that prioritizes addressing those causes mm -hmm. rather than simply um, vilifying the actors, um, heinous though they may be. Mm -hmm. Well, you're watching Global Connections Television, which is a privately funded, independently produced program. The opinions expressed on Global Connections are solely those of the moderator and his guest. We would invite our viewers to go to the website at www.globalconnectionstelevision.com to view some of our previous programs. Also, if you have any type of media outlet or you're involved with any, you're encouraged to go to our programs and to download them because they're provided free of charge as a public service in order to help people better understand international issues and how they impact us no matter which community where we live. My guest today is talking about many of these issues and the role of media. My guest today is Laura Flanders. Laura Flanders is the founder of The Laura Flanders Show and Grit TV. Laura, you, you got four or five things that I want to talk yeah, about. Let's go, back, let's go back to inequality. We'll move off terrorism for just a moment. Uh, I agree with you. I think inequality is definitely up there. It's one of the major yeah. problems that, uh, that we confront. And we see that this, it used to be years ago, we looked at Latin America. We say, look how, look at the huge chasm between the haves and the have nots yeah. in Latin America. Now we're starting to look at the United yeah. States and other developed countries. What can be done? What is the main problem? What's contributing mm. to this? Is it the fact that so many of these powerful economic interests make contributions to uh, political entities who then pass laws that are favorable to them so they don't pay their fair share of taxes? What, what is contributing to that? not only in the United States, but elsewhere, and what can be done about it? Well, I think there's a lot that contributes to it, obviously, and there's political manipulation and political, um, uh, political uh, corruption, for sure. But yeah. it's sort of a question of, of, of uh, chicken and egg. Is, is the corruption a result of the concentration of power, or is it a, the, the, the creator of it? I think I look more broadly at the question of the failure of markets. You know, I think that we have allowed market ideology to become this kind of religious tenant the sort of tenant of faith of, of most of our governments. It's, it's almost synonymous with democracy, where we must let the market rule. We have a, a world right now that is producing as much food as we need to feed everybody. We just don't know how to distribute it. We have new technology that could be giving us more leisure, making us healthier, helping us connect better, be more mobile. But what do we have? We have you know, obesity instead mm -hmm. of good distribution of food, with the obesity on the one hand, p starvation on another. We have um, congestion rather than the mobility that we mm -hmm. thought new technology would bring. We have people with less time, particularly in the United States. Um, I think you've seen people, their incomes may go up, but their time budget shrinks, mm -hmm. more stress, less leisure. I mean, these are market results functioning poorly for human needs. And if there was one thing that I think that we lack, and it's a lot of why we started the Laura Flounder Show, it's coverage of those kinds of issues that aren't party specific, they're not even national specific. They're almost sort of global issues having to do with not you, me, but we. Like, where's the we in this picture? And again, the UN has lots of great we stories. You know, what, what, what we nations are managing to do together. We don't get those stories. <laughs> um, we get the loggerhead stories. Uh, and it's lev at the same at every level. We have, I think, to recal, you know, to reconceptualize ourselves as citizens of the world, um, and outside of the categories, the market categories of just, you know, maker, owner, and buyer, or consumer. Uh, what about custodian? What about mm -hmm. commoner? What about citizen of the world? Uh, does this make any sense? Yes. <laughs> as a matter of fact, it does. Yes. No, it's very, very true. And because again, that that opens up a role for people who are neither employer or employee or mm -hmm. or consumers. I mean, what about our our caregivers? What about our elders? What about our youth? What mm -hmm. about those who are not engaging in the capitalist economy, but instead engaging in barter networks or sharing timeshares? Um, where's the space for valuing that? Uh, that mm -hmm. isn't creating these extremes of poverty and wealth, but rather mitigating against it, that is maybe like the native and indigenous traditions, custodianing the land and the resources. Mm -hmm. When we destroy a forest, it's a positive as measured by the, gr the gross national product. When we destroy 
a, a, a wetland, it's a positive in terms of the way that we think about mm -hmm. economies in the market system. So, you know, I, I think this is a big macro question and I, I'm glad you mm -hmm. asked it, but uh, I think it's a, a, an important one for us to talk about more often. Exactly, and we do have to start looking at, at the economic system and how we develop the gross uh, national product. The gro how do we define uh, it? How do we define it? What's, what all folds into it? And as you mentioned, when we destroy a pristine natural resource or pollute our environment or whatever. Or putting it's really people it's a in, ma in jail for exactly. years. Exactly. It's, it's, it's a negative. It's well, actually, but they, but, but it's they a negative it's in a terms positive. of human relations. Exactly. It's but very it's true. a positive in thus, you know, economic activity. No, it's not. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> well, before we run out of time, there's so many things I'd like to talk about. And I, I'm glad you're on the show because you get you bring a very unique perspective to looking at the media and how the media cover various issues. And when I think back to 2003 with the Iraq invasion, and we saw the build up to that uh, horrific, yeah. basically illegal invasion of Iraq by a, a sovereign country, and we see the aftermath of it, and a large number of the problems we face today, ISIS, some of the terrorism problems, trace right back That's to the invasion of Iraq. The, Iraq is rapidly becoming a failed state in many respects right now, and, and many other states within that region. What role do you think the media should have played as you think back to 2003, uh, March of t or yeah. the run up to 2003, as to providing objective information about this invasion and not just getting on board, being a cheering team for uh, all this misinformation that was put out there, yeah. basically reprinting the information. Even the New York Times, they put a lot of the misinformation in the paper that was absolutely totally wrong and many experts predicted that that was wrong. They yeah. said this was not right, but what role can the media player should play? Well, they've been playing a miserable role and you've done a good job of pointing out how many of the folks who were commenting then and were entirely wrong about mm -hmm. what was the situation in Iraq are still commenting and that's partly because they are usually, you know, paid consultants, members of the, of, of the military, mm -hmm. past or present. Um, you know, I think about that period after 2001 and, and think about, how m much pressure there was built up in the media for the U.S. to do something. Mm -hmm. We have to do something. Well, we'll invade Af Afghanistan. Well, it wasn't enough. Let's do something to make America safe. We've got to get them over there so they don't get us over here. Mm -hmm. And I hear shades of that again with respect, for example, to Syria. After that mm -hmm. horrifying picture of Ilan Kurdi showed up, the refugee, mm -hmm. three-year-old on the beach. Mm -hmm. um, no wonder, you know, people wanted to do something. And they had the sense of there was a flood of refugees coming to Europe and we should take more refugees. But this media drumbeat that something needed to be done obscured the fact that the U.S. had been doing a lot for years, mm -hmm. had been funding anti-Assad forces since 2012 through the CIA, had been imposing horrendous, I mean horrendous, draconian sanctions on Syria, had been providing air cover to anti-Assad forces. And it was in fact that air cover and the funneling of weapons to anti-Assad forces in Syria that Ilan Kurdi was, 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 was fleeing. His town had been bombed by, by ISIS and forces backed by the United States. That's why that, that, that picture, that's where it came from. Um, of course we should take more refugees. Of course there are things that should be done. But I'm very concerned that our media continue to do this kind of mm -hmm. spread a lie that what we've done has nothing to do with what is happening now. Or worse, that we haven't done anything and we need to do something. We've done a lot. And mm -hmm. it's been part of what's brought us here. And that's the problem. Th that's very true. And so often we see a sort of, an, uh, and people want to help. We right. want to help, but we're right. not quite sure what to do. But often we don't get the total picture, as you mentioned, like the fact that ISIS has actually been rolled back. It's lost 40% yeah. of the territory it had originally taken about a year and a half ago. But the media just don't bother to tell you that. They talk about all the other atrocities that are taking place. They also talk but about do something to, as if right. do something is synonymous with military action. There's a lot of other some things we could be doing. Uh, uh, right, and just activity does not translate into productivity right. or actually achieving something. Well, Laura, we're just about out of time. The last 30 seconds we have, the hardest question yet, over and above climate change and income inequality, what do you see as our major challenge as we move forward into the 21st century? I think our major challenge is really to think of ourselves as a we, not as a me. Not as a, you not as a me, I, st but as a we, us world. And, and that goes for our media. We need more um, we stories and stories of how 
we can uh, transfer power from the, the few to the many and do it effectively and well and get on with each other. It's not easy, but we, we can do it. Uh, and there are some great examples out there. Check out the program. You'll see a lot of them. Exactly. Do you want to mention one of them? We still well, have I 10 mean, seconds. Well, I was actually thinking of a guest that we had on this week, Vigo, Vigo Mortensen, the actor from the um, Ring trilogy. And he talked about Twilight of Empire. Uh, and, I, you know, he reflected on this question of Iraq. It's like we thought it was Twilight back then, mm -hmm. uh, but instead it's still with us. But he also talked about uh, some of the stories that he finds inspiring as a photographer, as a poet, as a painter, as an actor. Uh, and he has a new movie coming out that shows the way that media mm -hmm. can lift up the good uh, as well as emphasize the bad. Exactly. And the media do have a positive role to play, but they have to be much more objective and they have to provide a better picture, a total picture, a macro picture of the issues. Or just acknowledge their bias. I'll take that. Exactly. And also to question some of these so-called experts that pop up because so many of them, as I've discovered having Googled them, are well, they're talking about going to war and they're on the boards of directors right. of the defense contractors. They are a lot of them are retired military people. They have a direct interest in really being part of what President Eisenhower said, the military industrial complex, which today is now the military industrial congressional media complex and the march to war group in many areas. But Laura Flanders, I want to thank you so very much for a very interesting and a very informative program. Fun talking with you. Bill. Thank you. I'm Bill Miller. Thank you for joining us today on Global Connections Television. Thank <laughs> you.